Bible. I entitled this in Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 52, Jesus betrayed, arrested, and scriptures fulfilled. Jesus betrayed, arrested, and scriptures fulfilled. We'll look at it as sealed and betrayed in verse, uh, sealed and betrayed with a kiss in verses 43 through 45. Seize to fulfill the scripture in verses 46 through 50. And then finally in verses 51 through 52, scattered and streaking. Um, and, and so if you have your Bibles, you can kind of mark them in Matthew chapter 26, Luke chapter 22, and John 18. The same stories in those parts of the Bible. Uh, yesterday we had the, the Winterstrom Ranch grand opening. And we got to, it's always funny when the church does something and we do it for free, they, people don't understand, like, why are you doing it for free? Like, the gospel's free. And so, Teresa got to talk to a lot of the kids that she did face painting. Uh, Court, we will not, I, I got to have that thing because we did the, the, the Nerf gun thing again. I, by, by the end of the day, my back was shot. I was like, we got to have the other thing that we were working on. <laughs> yeah, so for the Cactus Fest. Cactus Fest, real simple, it's on uh, November 5th. So we actually, have the, um, we actually have the Kids Corner, and it's right, right down uh, on College Avenue, and it, it actually parallels um, right across the street from the, the flower shop. It's in that little corner, and that whole corner has been given, we did it all last year ourselves. But this year we have two other churches that are gonna help us but we'll still need help with the station so if you want to come out and serve what we're going to try to do is not keep you out there the whole time from 11:30 to 4:30, but maybe have you come out for an hour or two hours whatever you can do uh, to help kind of man a station uh, for the kids so all it is is they have games uh, um, and candy and toys and stuff that they win so every every game they play they have a chance to win something and so everything's free. That's the fun part is because every time the parent is like, well, why is it free? I'm like, the gospel of Jesus Christ is free. You know? And, and so it's, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, to meet people within the community that you'd probably never meet on a Sunday and meet people that you'd probably never meet maybe sometimes even here in Divine. Um, we've, we had people that came all the way from Kerrville last year. And you have to understand as we were doing this, people were just getting back to being too normal because of covid and we were like man you need to get we would talk to people and they're like well i go to this church and i'm like you need to get back to your church it's time to get back to your church well i haven't gone since covid it's time to go back and so we were able to encourage people able to meet people and it's going to be cool to be able to serve alongside first baptist uh divine is hopefully uh we'll have them and then prevailing word from uh Lytle. Uh, will be coming alongside of us. I got to try to button all that stuff up over the next two weeks. And, and so if you want to serve, you want to be a part of it, please just get with me. Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, it's pretty simple stuff is face painting. And we will not do balloon animals. We were a train wreck with that last year. I think we made a lot of just snakes. <laughs> we, we, had some, we had some people that actually knew how to do it, but they... They forgot their skills, so to say. And, uh, and so we'll probably stay away from those, but uh, we'll have like throwing games for them. We got, uh, Cord is working on a Nerf, uh, like a Nerf range type thing where it shoots the, the balls and everything will funnel in. So all you have to do is scoop the cup and put them in instead of bending down and resetting up. So we're, we're looking forward to it. And it's an awesome time. If you, don't, if, you, if you don't have time to serve, just come and be a part of it because it's a great chance to, to kind of see uh, and meet people here in the town. Great food trucks, uh, great vendors, uh, and uh, it's, it's just an awesome time. So, and music, free music, they have two stages as well. And so it's, it's a great time. They close all the streets off and it's a lot of fun. So, Mark chapter 14, we were off a week. So what I wanna do is I wanna read where we were at to bring us to where we're going today. So in Mark 14 and verse 32, I'm going to read down to verse 42 to kind of get us the picture of where we left off. And it says, And they went to the place of Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. 
Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to, Simon, he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray uh, that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is it not enough the hour has come? The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. So Jesus had been in a very intense prayer about the cup of wrath. Can it pass? Is there any other way, Father? And, and God the Father, there's no other way. And He knows that now His eyes are, are set to the cross. He knows what He has to do. And now as we get into this, Judas is going to return back into the scene. And so we're going to see it a lot. The reason why I read that to you is even as he's crying out and asking for that cup to be passed, is there any other way? He was being strengthened by angels for what was going to come. And now he's going to be betrayed by uh, Judas with a kiss in the garden. Remember the parallels of the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a lot of parallels there and we'll go over some of those. So let's look at our first point, sealed and betrayed with the kiss. And immediately he, he was still speaking. Judas came and one of the twelve and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now we know in Matthew chapter 26 verse 47 it says Judas came with him with a great crowd with a great crowd. And so he sent, they were sent from the, uh, the chief priests and elders, and they not only sent Roman guards, but they also sent temple police that were with them. But here's Judas the betrayer back on the scene again. And he had intimate relationship with Jesus for three years. He heard the gospel, he saw the grace of the gospel uh, not only be preached, but be applied. And yet he rejected the gospel and rejected Jesus Christ. And there are going to be people that do that. It happens. It's sad when it happens, but it happens. Their hearts have just gotten so hard they just don't want to hear the truth anymore. And all we can do at that point is just continue to pray that God softens that, that hardened heart that gets calloused. In John 6, verses 70 and 71, it says, Jesus answered, Did I not choose the twelve? And yet one of you is the devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Jesus always knew. And that's what I told y'all before, is there's nothing that takes God by surprise. Where you go, oh, man, I didn't think he was going to do that. I didn't think you were going to go left. I thought you were going right. That's, you're not taking God by surprise. You're not hiding anything from God. So Judas was always known who he was. And, and sadly, Jesus knew this as he's stealing money from the money bag. Jesus knew. In John 12, 6, it says, He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used, him, uh, used to help himself to what was put into it. This is very important for us to know. There's a very strong principle that I want as kind of a side note for us to remember. If you have to go to great lengths to cover something up, it's wrong. You're not hiding anything from God. Okay? You're not. You need to just go ahead and repent and deal with it with the Lord. Uh, Judas was sitting here stealing money, thinking he's getting away with it, but Jesus knew. And eventually his heart gets so hard that Satan enters. He probably believed at first, he probably believed that Jesus, Judas probably believed that Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman government. 
But that was it. And that if he hung with Jesus, there was a chance that he could come from a place of poverty to a place of prosperity and be someone of power and money because he was one of the disciples of Jesus. That's what his thoughts were. And we know that he went to the, uh, to the chief priests and elders in Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 and 16. And then one of the twelve who, whose name was Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. I told you all this before. The cheapest amount of, you could pay for a slave that time when Jesus was on the earth, was 30 pieces of silver. That's what Jesus was bought for. 30 pieces of silver. And it's a reminder to us that that Jesus dealt with betrayal. And you're going to deal with it too. Every one of you will have somebody betray you maybe once, maybe twice in your lifetime where you just... It takes almost like it's taking a piece of your heart out. Because it hurts so bad. Because the people who betray you are the ones that are closest to you. They're the ones that know you. And, and it hurts when it happens. And so one thing you need to remember, it, it happened to Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Then Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan, and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This was the foreknowledge this was going to happen. Scripture has had to be fulfilled. This was going to happen. Zechariah uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. It says, Then I said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. The Lord said to me, Throw it into the potter. And the Lord price at it, which was... Uh, which I was priced uh, by them, so that I took uh, 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the, the house of the Lord to the potter. And Scripture had to be fulfilled. And here they are, Judas bringing not only these men, uh, and, and we know this because in John 18.3 it says that they had occurred a, a, a band of soldiers. Some of your translations may have a cohort. A cohort. The, the, the Greek word for cohort or for band of soldiers is 600 men. 600 men filled with Roman guards and some uh, temple police carrying lanterns and torches, swords and clubs. And they come to, to grab Jesus. You can understand something here because they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus would have seen them coming. It takes about 20 20 minutes to walk up the Mount of Olives to get to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's it's on a slope. So you have 600 people coming carrying torches. You would have seen it. Jesus could have escaped at any moment and went into the wilderness of Judea. And He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He knew what he had to do on the cross. In Luke chapter 22, verse 52, it says, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come against me with robber, uh, against a robber with swords and clubs? So not only were there the temple police, but there were some elders that were there as well. So you had the religious people there as well. And man, religion loves to to bite down on people. And what we have with Jesus is a relationship. Religion loves to to squelch the the Holy Spirit. We have to be very careful of that. And it's sad that these men, through all this time, that they have been wanting to kill Jesus, now they decide, hey, I'm going with the 600 and I'm going to watch that man get arrested. It's about time. We're going to stop this little movement. It's coming to an end. And they think they're doing right by God. Because it was affecting them. It was affecting the way that they made money in the temple. 
It was affecting the way that they taught, they taught because Jesus taught with authority. They had, Jesus had crowds come in to watch Him teach and they couldn't get nobody. It's not about the crowd. It's about what's being taught. And so we know in, in verse 44, it says, Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up, up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Every time I read this, for, uh, and this is just B.C. days, it just reminds me of the Corleone family when, when Fredo you know, does wrong to the family and Michael gives him the kiss like, I know it was you. Because it's such a betrayal. And, and I know that's got nothing to do with it. That's just, you know, when I first came to Christ, that's how I wrapped my head around this verse. But then I, as I started studying Scripture a little more as I became a, a, a new believer in Christ, and I remember running across this verse in Psalm 41, nine. It says, Even my close friend in whom I trust, who I ate bread with, has lifted his heel against me. It's sad that people do this. And uh, it happens, unfortunately, way too much. But we know that, that in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. So one of the other things that hit me is, is as he's given the kiss, is Satan that's kissing Jesus. Because Satan had entered into Judas. And Satan's probably thinking, got you. We got you. This is over. And it would have been custom for a, a, a rabbi to be kissed. And this uh, word in the Greek actually means a, a, and a continual affection, fervently kissing the person. And yet Satan entered Judas and Satan kissed Jesus. In Proverbs 27.6 it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Why? Because a friend does it out of love. Sometimes he may, he may correct you or she may correct you in love. Right? But the worst ones are the fake ones that kiss you and kiss up to you. And yet they're there... They, they're your enemy. Because see, Judas portrayed Jesus with a kiss. See, a true friend corrects when you're wrong. I've known Isaiah since, what, 2010, 11, 12, somewhere around there. If he came to me and said, Mike, what you're doing is wrong, I would take every bit of what he's saying as truth. I've known Reuben long enough for him to do that. I've known Court long enough for him to do that. If they came to me and told me, Mike, I value their friendship that much. If Joe came and told me that, I've known Joe since 2008. And trust me, Joe has told me times, hey, you need to work on this. And it hurts. It, it hurts every time somebody tells you, man, hey, man, you hurt me. Or hey, the way you said this, there was no love in this. Are you Okay. But I love them enough to, to appreciate the fact that they care about me enough to check on me and help me and correct me. But the enemy will act like he likes you or she'll act like she likes you and kiss up to you. And then what do they do? They, they deceive you. They, they'll let you go ahead and just keep making a fool of yourself. They don't care. They don't care. A legitimate friend will actually help you walk away from an evil thing and not let you go to it. That's a real friend in Christ. And that's what we need to surround ourselves with. Our second point is cease to fulfill the Scripture. And we're going to see that there are certain uh, Scriptures that need to be fulfilled as, as Jesus was being arrested. And they laid hands on Him and seized Him. 
And I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, 50. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. That's what he tells Judas. Friend. As he's being crucified on the cross, he's, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How many times are you to forgive? And yet you don't want to. And we see it time and time again in Jesus' life. And they seized him. The Greek word means to seize with power, to take possession, to be the master of or to rule over. So they're seizing him as, okay, this is it, you're done. Your little reign, whatever this little band of people that you had following you, it's over. We're seizing you. And, and what's sad is, is as you read the Scripture, but, there, uh, but one of those who stood there drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. As you, as you see him being seized, there's no charges that were ever given. He was just seized. And that goes against the Sanhedrin's rules. They're breaking their own rules. And then we have Mr. Peter. My favorite. Because it says, but the one who, of those who stood by and drew his sword and struck his servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Right? So who cut off his ear? We know it's Simon Peter in, in John chapter 18. This is why, again, remember when we started this book, I told you all the synoptic gospels are so important. Because they're different camera angles and you get, you get more information. And what's cool is Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have the account, but John has this account as well. And that's why it's important to understand Scripture when you're, when you're studying it. In John 18, 10, verse 11, it says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword... Why did Peter have a sword? He's ready to go, Right? He drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So we even know the guy's name. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So Jesus immediately heals him. And we know that from Luke chapter 22, verse 51. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So Peter is rebuked by Jesus. And I mean, you've got to give it to Peter. There are 600 Roman soldiers and temple officers combined, right? And Peter pulls his sword out. He's, he may be stupid, but he's brave, right? And, and sadly, he, you know, thank God he hit the ear. He was probably aiming for the head. He may have been trying to hit Judas. We don't know. He ends up cutting off an ear. And one thing I want to make sure you get out of this is this is all emotions, feelings, and anger. Peter did this in his emotions and feelings and then anger pursued it and then wrath right behind it. He fell into sin. But what did Jesus tell him? You know, maybe you should have been awake when, when you were supposed to be praying because you fell right into that temptation. Matthew 26, verse 51 through 53, and it says, And behold, one of, one of those who were there, uh, who were uh, with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew a sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. And then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Violence breeds violence. Okay? The gospel is not violent. The gospel is not violent. 
I am a, a and we'll, we'll talk about this because, you know, we know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 6, 15, it says, And as the shoes of your feet have been having put on the readiness given by the gospel of what? Peace. Yes, you have a sword. The sword is the word of God. You don't have a physical sword. You have a Bible. And that's why we went over that this past week, Ephesians 6, 17, and take, a, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. And, and back in Matthew, it, it tells you, do, do you not think I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? He's like, look, I can, this can end right now. But it's not supposed to. This is not what the Father wanted. See, Peter is dealing with his own self-interest. And he was, instead of living by God's authority and seeing the Scriptures be fulfilled, he wanted to see his own, his own self-interest be taken care of. Now, don't get me wrong, Peter had a lot of zeal, but it was misplaced zeal. This is what happens when we, when somebody speaks out in anger, how are you going to respond? You know, how are you going to, how are you going to react? Are you going to lash back out at them? Because let me tell you something, when people start pulling out swords of anger, it, it becomes bloody. Because it gets this battle back and forth. And that's not what we are. We, it is the gospel of peace that we have. Anybody ever watch hockey? I know I'm probably the only one. Hockey is a really crazy thing, man. It's, it's pretty cool to watch in person. It's hard to watch on TV. But let me tell you, some of the, some of the, the, the greatest players were the scorers. Right? But you, you cannot be uh, someone in hockey that just allows your anger to keep you in the penalty box. Right? You spend all your time in the penalty box and you're not scoring goals. You're not being used for what you were supposed to be out there to be used for. You're actually hurting the team because you're sitting in the penalty box. And Jesus asked that question in verse 48 in Mark 14. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out against me as a, against me, a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? These men were, were coming in power. And the sword was power. It was used for fear at the time. And they used the sword to control and manipulate uh, the people. The religious leaders used it to bring the thugs with the swords. And he's like, you, you come to me. And he goes, I've been in the temple. I've been, y'all have seen me. You could have arrested me at any time. And see, Jesus isn't protesting the arrest. He's protesting the way that the chief priests and the elders are handling it. It's the way that they're handling it. They're, they're, they're handling him as if he's a robber. Now, he's going to be put between two robbers on the cross. And yet, he didn't belong there. Who was supposed to be there? Barabbas. It's sad. But he tells them in verse 49, Day after day I was with you in the temple and you did not seize me. You didn't seize me. A couple of things that are real important. What time of day did they come to pick him up? It was nighttime. Where did they come to pick him up? In the garden. They didn't do it in the city. Why? Because there could be a riot. They would protest. And so they did it at night and away from the city. That's what Jesus was upset about. That's what he was upset about. The way that you're handling it, the way that the chief priests and the scribes, they're breaking all of their laws to get what they want. And we see that happening today in our world. We have a, a, a law 
that we're supposed to follow and yet we don't follow it. When 75% of our laws were based upon the Bible, when we walk away from the law of God, we walk away from the law of, of the land, we're walking away from the Lord as well. And we're seeing cities like New York and Los Angeles and Chicago that are just, they look like places that I served in combat. Literally. And, and it breaks my heart, man, because at the end of the day, those are broken people. They're broken. They're being left to their own devices. Some people need the law. Sometimes when somebody gets put in jail, that's the time when they go, I need Jesus. Prison ministry is one of those things, man, that, you know, Matt and, um, and, and Jimmy and Mike Rios and them are looking at going to the juvenile detention centers here hopefully soon in the next year. Let me tell you something. A lot of times that's, that's rock bottom for people. And that's when they come to the place where, you know what, I've done everything my way. I need to, I need to do it Jesus' way. And they give their life to Christ. We need to understand that, that, that we have, you know, as we look at this, they're breaking their own laws, that they're walking away from the things that they were supposed to be doing. Um, <laughs> think about it. They were telling Jesus during the Sabbath, that they're breaking the law of the Sabbath, and yet they're breaking the law. Hypocrites. Whitewashed tombs. In Luke chapter 23, verse 43, or 53, I love what it says, When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness. Power of darkness. Satan is at work. Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, He delivered us up from the dominion of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it says, This is the message that we heard from Him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him, we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. Think about it. I remember when they had to come, we had a huge leak backed up, I think, where the easement was for our house, and they had to come in and they dug. It took almost a week for them to fix the saws. It, ha it happened at nighttime. Man, you want to see something scary? Open that manhole and shine a light in it. And you see all the roaches just phew. and that's what light does they scatter they don't want to be near the light they want to keep everything in the dark and that's what they were trying to do here they're trying to keep it all in the dark trying to keep it all under wraps because they're going to have his, as we go into the next few weeks they're going to have his trial they're going to just keep let's just get it going so we can get them crucified But he says, but let the Scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. You know, there are some 108 prophecies that have been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Even in Zechariah's prophecy, it was written some 500 years before when it talks about them, uh, the shepherd and the sheep, uh, as the sheep scatter in Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the, the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. That prophecy was written some 500 plus years before Jesus ever walked the earth. And it was fulfilled along with 108 other ones. And the probability of those things being fulfilled, when you look at the math on it, there was a mathematician, I believe, out of Stanford that actually did the math on it. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. And yet we know that even in the book of Isaiah and, and, and chapter 53, there were so many prophecies that were fulfilled. Time and time again. How many prophecies did Muhammad fulfill? Not a one. 
Not a one. How many did Joseph Smith fill? Not a one. Jesus did. And he's going to continue as he comes back during his second coming. And then he's not going to be the lamb. He'll be the lion. In Mark 14, 27, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And we know that they all took off. They all took off. In, 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 the, in verse 50, And they all left him and fled. They booked. They're gone. Like, I'm out of here. They seized Jesus. They have swords. They have clubs. They have power. We're done. And they scatter. And he knew this. And it's sad because, you know, at the end of the day, that happens sometimes. You know, you, you start serving with somebody and, and you, you try to figure out what happened and they just scatter. It happens. You can end up in a room like this and they go, well, this is not what I thought this was going to be. And they scatter. And it's like, you know, Jesus went from place to place, spoke outside, spoke in a boat. Now, I would have loved to have been there for that one. Right? That's speech ministry 101, man. You want to be there for that. But the church is never a building. We forget that. These things had to happen. Everything being set up by God. John 15, 20 says, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All. They all fled. All of them fled. Uh, you choose to follow Christ, you will be persecuted. Not once. Many times. And, and persecution is different for, for different places. Some people lose their life. Some people put, are put in jail for their belief in Jesus. I think, I think America is going through just a little taste of what it is to be pressed. And, and that's why, you know, getting out and, and meeting people and talking about the gospel and having somebody come in and grab tacos and inviting them to church. Man's here cleaning. He was hungry. Nobody fed him. That's what we're here to do. We're here to we're here to we're here to uh, to to feed them physically and spiritually if we can. That's the that's the point. And not everyone, you know, even though that man was sitting out there by himself, and there were people eating down in the other room. We need to be looking for those people that are outcasts, that are outsiders. We need to be looking for them. Because they need Jesus. That's what the church has forgotten. We've gotten so busy on building these big buildings and having all this stuff that we forgot about the people on the outside of the walls of the church. And we have to, we have to be busy about doing that. That's why we invite people to church. That's why we tell people about Jesus. We have to be willing to do that. I watched my wife as she sat and did face painting talk to those little kids. One by one. And, and it's, it's amazing. The church has to get back to the public square. We can't walk the middle of the road anymore. Our weapons are not physical weapons. Our weapons are the truth of the Word of God. We have the Bible. We have our, our, our truth. We have our love. We have our prayer. But I want you to think about this just for a second. The moment the church was removed from the public square happened back in the late 60s when they stopped praying in school. You can't pray in school. And then there was this great falling away in the school system. And then what do we do next? Ten Commandments. No, no, no. Can't have that up. 
Matter of fact, you can't even have that up in the courthouses. Took it away. We've seen, and I love the way Governor Huckabee said this. He says, far from more than just taking prayer or Bible or reading out of schools, it is a fact that people sue the city now to have a manger. If there's a manger scene, they sue the city. In California, they had a cross for the, the fallen soldiers and they wanted the cross removed from the mountain. They want to make Christian businesses forced to pass out abortion pills. And at what point does the church say, enough? And say, look, that's, that goes against God's Word. Right? Right? So I see guys like Jack Hibbs and I see guys like John Randall and I, I see men, uh, even like, uh, I forget the pastor's name, out of God Speak Church, when he, he, what was put on his heart is the church still needs to meet in California. And they almost took his church. A million dollars in fines. And even the, the Christian bank that had the loan wanted to foreclose his loan. He ended up getting all that money back because he won the lawsuit in, in the Supreme Court. But he stood for what God had put on his heart to stand for. And at some point, Christians have to start standing again. We have to get back into the public square. And I'm not saying that you go and you, you have the Bible, you have the truth, you give it with love, and you, and you spend time praying. We need to be involved in the city and the chamber, and the schools, right? And with the other churches. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. The church has gotten away to where they just hide in their, their buildings. It's become a bomb shelter. And they don't really care what happens on the outside of the walls of the church. And they know how to be Christian inside the walls of the church, but they don't be Christian outside the walls of the church. And what happens is, is we're not sharing the gospel. We're not standing and saying, hey, that's wrong. You trying to teach a five-year-old child or a six-year-old child about being transgender is wrong. That's not your responsibility as a teacher. And the church has to get back into the public square. And we've seen too many times where we're, we're running away from this. We're running and fleeing from the spiritual battles. The same way the disciples fled, we're doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing. One day, and I probably won't be here, but one day, you teaching about homosexuality or you teaching about transgender or gender will cause you to be put in jail as a pastor. Because that's what they're coming for next. And, and at the end of the day, we have to understand, like, we stand on God's truth. And we need to not flee from those fights. In our personal lives and in our public. In our public life. Like, we need to, hey, we need to stand for God's Word. We need to. And that has nothing to do. Do you understand? Did I say anything about political parties? No. Doesn't have anything to do with it. God's Word is not a political party. God's Word is not masked or unmasked, vaccine or not vaccine. It's God's Word. If it goes against God's Word, then that's what we stand on. That's when we say this is not right. We need to get involved. That's why I say, I, you know, I love servants in the church. It's awesome. But I also love, like Reuben, Reuben teaches baseball. He gets to be with kids I would never get to see on a weekly basis, and he gets to be a, a man of God in front of them. You go, man, Mike, I think I want to run for office. Praise God, go for it. I want to run for the school board. Praise God, go for it. We need more Christians in those places. Not every person is called to be a pastor, preacher, evangelist. Not every one of us are called to do that. God may have gifted you with something else. But stop fleeing from it. Stop running from it. Be a light where you're at. 
I'm sorry, I get a little, I didn't realize we're in such a small room. I get passionate when I get into stuff. I apologize. But I didn't realize we're in a small room. It's probably echoing, and I apologize. Um, but it says here, it says, um, one of the things I want you to understand is Peter's day. Peter had a rough day. Okay? Peter had already been told he was going to be sifted by Satan, right? And he, told, he was told by Jesus in Mark 14, 29, Peter said, even though they will all fall away, I will not. And yet Jesus fell away. Oh, Peter fell away. Peter fell. Right? Peter was supposed to be awake when he was supposed to be praying. What was Peter doing? Sleeping. How many times? Three times. And Christ told him, look, you're going you're gonna to need to be careful because you're going to fall into temptation. And what did Peter do? He fell right into temptation and cut that man's ear. It's a rough day of ministry for Peter. And there'll be days like that when you're doing ministry. And you know what? God loves you and God wants that, uh, that, that, that repentance. And sometimes, uh, even, even as Peter, you know, it's a reminder to us that Peter was rebuked by Jesus. And what does Peter do? And that's why I'm bringing this up. He takes off. He fled. And sometimes what happens is when somebody rebukes you, they're gone. They're in the wind. I, I w if I ever have to correct you, it will be with love and truth. And the last thing I ever want you to do is flee. But can I tell you, I've been rebuked before. The word itself even sounds painful, right? It needed to be done. My pastor pulled me aside and said, Hey, Mike, the way this was handled was wrong. It hurt. I had only been walking with the Lord for maybe, maybe three years. And that was the first time I had messed up. And I messed up in the church. I got upset with somebody. And, and I was prior military, and he kept coming forward at me. And because I had served in combat, when somebody comes forward at me and won't stop, and I ask them, just give me space... I'm thinking, I'm fixing to take you out. And so I'm working my way out of the church. And the brother followed me. And thank God one of the other brothers grabbed him and said, hey, just give him some space. And somebody prayed for me. And then I had to walk in and do worship. And I was like doing worship, just like cringing. By the time the word hit, the tears start flowing. And my brother, man, you know, he, he was like, one of the things that really hurt is he said, man, he goes, when you spoke to me, you spoke to me with no love. And it didn't matter who was right or wrong at that point because that's what he received. And I said at that moment, I'm sorry, I apologize. I didn't mean it in that way, and it, but it was taken that way and I apologize. My pastor was like, these things happen. Sometimes we get very passionate. But sometimes we do things in the flesh, and you're doing too much in the flesh. We were there seven days a week. We were on, I mean, I was, I, when I talk to people about burnout, when I ask you to slow down, it's because I see you going down a path that I've already been down. I was on fire. I thought, man, I'll just, I'll be here all the time. Didn't want to be anywhere else. I loved it so much. But I was tired. And sometimes we do get rebuked. And in those rebukes, there should always be love and truth. Always. Okay? Always. And, and that's what I pray, you know. And I pray you don't flee. I would rather you tell me, just be honest with me. And say, man, that hurt, dude. Because right? I'd rather, I'll receive that. And say, well, maybe I can present it in a better way next time. I apologize, you know. But at the end of the day, that's what... That's what being in the church is, you know. We're family. Sometimes we step on toes, you know, and, it, and we have to be careful. Um, but we want to be here in unity, and we don't want to see anybody flee. Last little point here in, uh, is scattered and streaking. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Every time I read this as a new believer, I was like, what in the world? Is, why is this in here? It's very embarrassing. 
And that's why I said streaking. Scattered and streaking. And all. But this we know was most likely, most everybody agrees, this is Mark. Mark was a young man at the time, and uh, he's the, the writer of the book of Mark. Uh, he received the information from Peter. You can imagine Peter saying, hey, include this. Can you imagine him going, not that, dude. And so the, the garment that he would have worn uh, during this time in the Greek actually means it's a, it's a tunic. Uh, one that we've seen in the Middle East many times, it's a, it's a very lightweight garment that they wear on a daily basis uh, to keep out of the heat because uh, it's so hot over there. And it tears and rips very easily. Uh, so all you have to do is grab it and you can come out of it pretty quickly. Uh, there's parallels here to the Garden of Eden. Why? They were naked, Right? And in our nakedness, he exposed the, uh, that we deserted God. And, and here we have this young man, Mark, deserting God and taking off as well. And uh, there's going to be a book into this too because the term that's used there is young man. This is the very beginning of the... Uh, as Jesus is seized and then the trials are going to begin and it's going to seem like, man... Everything is, 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 is going wrong, but we know that there is victory at the end. And he uses that term again in Mark 16, verses 5 and 6. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And so the young man they're talking about is actually an angel in white robe. And so it's a bookend as we look at the two uh, from the Garden of Gethsemane to, uh, to after the crucifixion, the resurrection. And, and it's just a great picture of uh, the victory of God that we see. And, and it's, it, again, you read this and you're going, man, why was this included? One of the most probably embarrassing moments of a kid. I mean, 600 soldiers. You can imagine. They're going to laugh. I can tell you, you've been around the military. Something like that. They're going to giggle. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to laugh. That's embarrassing. But he had to include it. Peter had him include it. And that's because of that parallel of them leaving the garden, fleeing Jesus the way that Adam and Eve were hiding in their nakedness. From God. Their sin. So all the disciples are gone. Jesus is seized. And next week we'll enter into the trial. And then our last little bit of application. And then this is where we'll finish off. I haven't done these in a while. I don't know why I had these this week. So I'm going to do these. Sometimes I try to give you something to think about after the, the teaching. First application. When you have to start going to great lengths to cover yourself and what you do, you may be doing something wrong. Is there something wrong going on in your life that needs to be dealt with? If you're hiding it, thinking you're hiding it from God, you're not. Okay? You need to repent. You need to walk away from it. You need to deal with it. Judas went to great lengths to steal money. Judas went to great lengths to betray Jesus. And yet, Jesus knew the whole time. And we just need to repent and turn back to the Lord. Second application, are you fleeing Jesus? Maybe you're running from a spiritual battle. Why? Why? Maybe you're running God has put something on your heart to do and you're fleeing from it. Why? The disciples fall. They take off. And yet, you know what the beauty of that is? Jesus loved them enough to restore each one of them. Except Judas. Because Judas never believed. And yet, that was the men that birthed the early church. And you go, man, they fled Jesus. Peter chopped the dude's ear off. And yet, God's going to restore each of them. 
But Jesus never gave up on them, and He doesn't give up on us. So if you're, if you're fleeing from a spiritual battle, stop fleeing. Stop. And ask Jesus to help you steady your feet and follow Him. Peter struck someone with anger. Are you responding in your emotions and feelings? Are you being led by God or are you doing the leading? Because Peter jumped out. Jesus didn't tell him, hey, pull your sword out, strike somebody. Peter just went, let's go for it. And he, he was going to deal with the repercussions later. What if Peter would have been killed? What if Peter would have killed the soldier and struck him in the head? What are they going to do to Peter? Kill him? What does that do? At the end of the day, we need to be slow in our reactions and, and not allow emotions and feelings to control our day. Okay? That's important. And then lastly, have you been rebuked before? How did you respond? It says a lot about your heart. Did you disagree and argue? Because it's just exposing what's going on. Right? Great little piece of Scripture. A lot of little details in there. Even though you read it, and you go, okay, Jesus was arrested. By 600 temple soldiers and Roman guards. And He saw them two miles away coming. And yet He didn't run. Because He knows what He has to do on the cross. And He does it for us. 